So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something. I want, I want to know if this sounds familiar to anybody in the room besides me, okay? Does everybody have their shoes? Did everybody grab their towels? I have my bag. Did you bring your toothbrush? Are you sure everybody has their shoes? Did you turn the lights off? All right. Sound familiar? Sounds, it sounds like a dialogue that you hear before almost any trip that you go on, right? Well, in my childhood, this was a kind of conversation that happened a little bit more than I care to mention. Only for me, it wasn't a family vacation. This conversation meant it was time to move again. You see, I was the, the, the only common child between my parents, and I moved back and forth regularly between houses, sometimes almost on a yearly basis. Now, my dad was an Air Force man, and this is his family there, and of course, that's teenage me in the back. Um, <laughs> And because he was an Air Force man, this meant moving from time to time, sometimes from one state to another. Um, while my needs were always met when I lived with dad, being established and making lasting friends was a really big challenge. Now, when I lived with mom, this is our family here. Yeah, we, we're all a little bit older now. <laughs> I got better looking. <laughs> but when I lived with mom, you know, we had some financial struggles, which often meant more address changes. Um, mom did the best she could. She was a single mother. She was raising four kids in the 90s. That was not easy. My mom worked multiple jobs. Oftentimes, she would get up early, go to work, come home late. But we still had our struggles, and we moved from one house to another. There was a period of time where we lived in a motel. It didn't look like that when we lived there, but that's recent. Um... <laughs> We lived with various friends. We borrowed space. We borrowed bedrooms, couches, floor space, whatever we could get sometimes. Uh, eventually, we landed in a single wide trailer, and we lived there for about two years. And for us, you know, that's a considerably long time. I didn't realize it at the time, but all this instability created some issues for me. In all the moving, I lost friendships. I lost material possessions that held a lot of sentimental value to me. Um, as a result, I developed a detachment complex. I could not let things hold too much meaning to me. I could not let people get too close to me. If I did, I would lose the possession or people would go away and I would be left holding the hurt again. This gave rise to my discontent problem. I made grades, but they could have been better. I had friends, but I could have more. I had a girlfriend, she could be prettier. I could not allow myself to be satisfied with anything or anyone. It wasn't until I became an adult that I realized that I had these issues. These things gave Satan the foothold that he needed in my life. Now, I was raised in the church, okay? All right, some of y'all were at church every time the doors were open, okay? My family, as it seems, we were there to open the doors before you got there, and we were shutting the church down long after y'all were at home in bed. That was us. And no matter if I live with mom or dad, Saturday mornings were likely to feature three things, bleach, pine saw, and gospel music. Some of y'all are raising houses like that too. In my early teen years, my relationship with Jesus became personal. It felt like I was growing as a Christian. However, when the issues that I mentioned before began to show up, I started unhealthy coping mechanisms and I started using pornography as my new God. What seemed like a comfort over, the, over a span of time became a new problem. Addiction is a trap. I spent 15 years trapped in addiction to pornography and sexual relationships. During that time, I, met, I ruined many relationships, broke up my own family, objectified women, subjected them to my whims. I caused emotional damage, and I fought a hard-fought battle with the way I perceived my own body. And, and I placed myself in dangerous situations, all in the name of my addiction. I maintained some of the most unhealthiest relationships, and this was all for the sake of addiction. I'm so grateful, though. My story did not end that way. <laughs> Through a sequence of God-orchestrated events led by a young lady that I met in college who was both annoying and, and brave enough to steal food from me, if you know that story, I ended up at this church. I got in recovery here, 
and I am now celebrating eight years free from pornography and sexual addiction. Oh, and by the way, I married that annoying girl, by the way. So young girls out there keep stealing his food. As I look back over the time I spent in addiction, I found solace in scripture. One passage that has become my life verse, Psalms 116, one and two. It says, I love the Lord for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. This verse encompasses some very important ideas that have been constant in my life. I have trouble, or I've had trouble. I currently have trouble. I will have trouble. But I can call on God and he will hear my cries. Now, in the past, I had trouble. My life was by no means the worst life a person could live. I don't want to con convict you of that, okay? Um, there were good times. There were periods of stability. However, like everyone else's life, there were some troubles. There were unstable times that led to my insecurities. My insecurities led me to my addictions. My addiction led me to harming myself and others mentally and spiritually. At some point in our past, We've all had trouble. Verse one says, I, he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. This is a reflection on what God has done, how God has already rescued us from troubles of our past. Sometimes in the midst of what's going on, we need to take a moment and reflect on what God has already done in our lives. We have to understand that troubles uh, the troubles from which he has already saved us, all right? For me, being rescued from my past troubles, you know, the pornography addiction, all that came along with it, um, the damage that I caused, being rescued from all that meant that I had to trust God. I was, I was, it wasn't until I surrendered to him that his work in my life began to show up. While surrendering to Jesus helped me find sobriety for my addictions. Surrendering to Jesus did not equate to immunity from temptation of those sins, nor did it mean I would become immune to the struggles of other things in life. I still, to this day, have troubles. Y'all understand what trouble is like, right? Okay, so let me give you some examples. I struggle knowing which form I need when I go to the DMV, okay? I have gone to the DMV nearly 23 years of my life every year, and I still don't know what forms I need to accomplish anything. I have no idea how much money I'm supposed to pay. They could be ripping me off year after year, and I have no idea. I, I don't know, okay? Another struggle. I'm married, okay? <laughs> See that picture? That was like one of the greatest days of my life right there. It was awesome. Um, I'll tell you the story later. <laughs> but anyway, so I've been, if you've been married more than maybe a few minutes, you know the struggle of loving another person, and it can be challenging. My wife can tell you all about the challenges of loving someone who is as stubborn as I am, okay? <laughs> you didn't have to say that. <laughs> all right, so I also struggle with pride. I was raised to be independent. So asking for help can be challenging for me because I feel like I should be able to do everything. One of my favorite signs that I recently saw said, I really wish somebody around here would help me. No, not like that. Get out of the way. You're doing it wrong. Okay, so y'all understand what that's like, right? <laughs> All right. There are also family relationships and friendships that are struggles for me. I struggle with having to draw healthy boundaries between people I love in order to protect my peace, my family, and my relationship with God. That's not an easy thing to do. Psalms 116 starts off, or Psalms 116 1 starts off saying, I love the Lord. It says love in the present tense. I love him. Even in the struggles I'm facing right now, I love him. Understand the word struggle implies two things. 
It implies that there's a temptation, but it also implies that I'm fighting it. That means the fight is not lost. Now, if you're dealing with a struggle or trouble of some sort right now in your life, I wanna take a moment and I wanna share some advice with you that I've learned over the years, all right? So they didn't give y'all an outline, so you might wanna write this on the back because one day I'm gonna be teaching seminars and you got to pay for this kind of stuff. So go ahead and, go ahead and write it down now, all right? First, your struggle does not make you bad or evil. Your struggle does not make you bad or evil. People tend to think that somehow struggling make, or having trouble means you're bad, you're faulty, or worse, you're living sinfully. Jesus addressed this issue in John 16, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Now, Jesus didn't say that trouble would find us because of our sin. He told us there would be trouble even if we followed him, or better yet, because we're following him. But he also told us that through him, we could overcome that trouble. Now, the next piece of advice I'll give you is that you're not the only person with that struggle, the one you're going through, the one you're facing. I can't tell you how many times I heard people say things like, oh, no one understands the struggle. No one's had it this bad before. I'm the only one who knows what I'm going through. I can tell you that I've said things like that many times myself. The problem is that those thoughts are not true, okay? In 1 Corinthians, Paul encourages the church in Corinth in chapter 10, verse 13, saying, there is no temptation that has overtaken you except that which is common to mankind. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure. It, if you are facing it, Someone faced it before you. You can't have an original struggle, okay? Now, I know not all y'all are good at math, okay? So let, let me break down some numbers for y'all for a minute, okay? There are currently 7.9 billion people on planet Earth, right? That means that the odds of you having an original struggle is one in 7.9 billion, okay? Now, let me give you some more perspective. The odds of winning the Powerball lottery are one in 292 million. Now, I went to public school, so check me on the math here, okay? If my math is right, that means that you are 27 times more likely to win the Powerball than you are to have an original struggle, okay? All right? So, now, that should clear up some things for some of y'all since y'all been playing the lottery for years and ain't won nothing. Okay? All right. So now, the last piece of advice I'm going to give you is that you need to get connected. Your struggle doesn't make you bad. You're not the only one dealing with it. You might as well get connected to healthy people who are dealing with the same issues or better yet, who have found victory concerning that issue, all right? Here in this very church, we got a number of ways that people can get connected, okay? You can find hope, help, and healing here. If you're dealing with a life-altering behavior or a fallout from one of them, we have care and recovery night here on Tuesday nights in this very room, okay? My people. We also have Life Recovery Central Connections class on Saturdays evenings right after this and then Sunday mornings at 1130, all right? If, you're, if a sudden change in a relationship has rocked your life, such as a death or a divorce, we have grief share or divorce care, or maybe your current struggle is something more along the lines of an everyday issue, like how to build and lead a Christ-centered family. We have connection classes such as Solo Moms 
or together or family builders for those kinds of struggles. These connection groups are not just for people who've made bad decisions in life. They're also for people who, have, who are dealing with everyday issues, everyday struggles of life, and just need some support. This is, this is healing for all kinds of issues. Now, healing for me came when I found a healthy space to say, I love Jesus, but I struggle with pornography. Since that time, I've learned to live free from pornography. I have built healthy bonds with people around me, even so far as to let down my emotional guard walls that I was talking about earlier that led me to my detachment. Most of all, and this is the important part, I have deepened my personal relationship with Jesus. Now, in trusting Jesus, I have experienced large amounts of victory in life, but I am not foolish enough to think that I would never see trouble again. Over the years, I've heard people say stuff like, oh, Richard, you've been in that recovery program for years. Aren't you recovered yet? You know, I hate to break it to you, but as we experience victory in Jesus, temptation never stops coming, okay? Now, the namesake for my youngest son is also my favorite philosopher. His name is Soren Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard once said, trouble is the common denominator of living. Everyone who is living has had some sort of trouble and will continue to have trouble in one form or another. Remember Psalms 116.2 ends with, I will call on him as long as I live. This is an indication that there is trouble. There will, we will continue to have trouble to come. The hard part of struggling can often be understanding why troubles continue to come. If I trust Jesus, shouldn't trouble just stop, right? Now, I wish that were so, but it's not. Remember, Jesus told us that in John 16, that we would have trouble. So why does trouble keep coming? Now, I don't really have an answer for that. However, I will share with you a few reasons I've seen in my own life and that seem to be common in the people's lives around me. Okay, get that paper back out because this is, again, free stuff that I'm giving to you so you don't have to pay for it later, all right? So sometimes trouble is beyond your control. There just isn't anything you could have done to prevent it. In my early life, the trouble that was beyond my control was the constant moving. I was a child and there was nothing I could have done to change the living situation. At the time, I had no background in psychology. I couldn't see the mental processes that were leading me into addiction. In your life, trouble could look like a job loss. It could look like a spouse caught in infidelity. It could be past abuse. It could be a defiant child. It could be COVID. For, th for these situations, there isn't much you can do. The only thing you can do is carry these problems to Jesus and let him guide you. Now, trust this. Trust that his will and his way is better for your life than anything you can pursue anywhere else in life, all right? Now, another reason for trouble in our lives, make sure you write this down, all right, is we made decisions that brought us into trouble. These are self-inflicted issues. In my life, I chose pornography as a false solution to my already existing problems and it just made things worse. For you, it may be that, you know, get, get rich quick scheme that you failed for. Maybe it's going for drinks for, with a coworker after work, or maybe you decided you didn't need church anymore. You may have heard the definition of insanity is repeating the same action, expecting a different outcome. Another way of thinking about insanity is refusing to take the right action and expecting positive outcome. Getting connected is a, is a really good way to break out of that self-inflicted insanity. And again, I've told you about the opportunities that we have here. Another reason for trouble is that trouble happens as a spiritual attack. 
Satan knows your value to the kingdom of God, okay? He's not ignorant to that. And he doesn't want you building God's kingdom. I sponsor and I mentor men who struggle with pornography and anger. For three years, I led the ministry called Celebration Place, which is our pre-covery ministry for children of adults who are in recovery. Satan never once attacked me in my addiction like he did when I started leading people to Jesus. God knows his plans for you, and I'm convinced Satan knows too. We fight spiritual attack by remaining faithful and trusting God because he, we know that he works all things, the good things and the bad things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Now, the last reason for trouble in our lives is that our lives are a witness to others. I recall a particular instance in 2016. Now, I was devoted to Jesus. My recovery from addiction was going really well. I was a faithful husband. I was going to church. I was paying tithes. I was serving in ministry. I was the drummer for the Celebrate Recovery worship team. Some of y'all have heard that story too. I was checking all the boxes, okay? yet I was still facing some significant struggles. I was struggling with raising teenagers. Anybody know about that? Anybody? Okay. I was struggling letting go of some unrealistic expectations of my marriage. I was having troubles with authority figures in my life. One day I was driving to work and I was having this conversation with God, and I asked him, why am I still struggling? I'm doing everything that you ask me to do. I remember as I was driving across the Broadway Bridge, y'all remember the old one, that, you know, the one that was unstable and needed to come down, but they couldn't blow it up with dynamite, remember that? <laughs> I remember the radio was off because I really wanted to focus on this conversation with God, and I clearly remember his response. As I started ascending over the north side of the bridge, I can take you to the spot where I heard him. I have never in my life heard the audible voice of God, but this was so clear, it was unmistakable. God said to me, Richard, you're not here because of anything you've done. You're not even here for you. You see, we might be facing the same struggle as someone else who has a little less faith. They need to see how God responds to our faithfulness in the midst of troubles. As Christians, the world is watching us. And those who see us struggle need to see when God works his miracles in our lives. Someone who is shedding tears, uh, the same tears that you once cried, needs to see you dancing in joy. Someone whose marriage is dead needs to see your marriage reconciliation. Someone who struggles to make it through the day without pornography needs to know that you have attained eight years of sobriety from pornography and that you found victory over this issue. The Bible says to us in 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4, Praise be to God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Sometimes God allows us to face trouble because he will pull us through. Our lives are a visible testimony to others who struggle. We have to trust in him, not just that he's going to pull us through, but that he will also be there with us in every moment of it. So if trouble keeps coming, even if it serves a purpose, why should I keep on going? Why, I, now, I've shared with you my life verse, okay? But I want to share a beautiful promise from God to you as a comfort. Revelations 21.4 says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. We keep going because we know one day the suffering has to end. We will experience joy unspeakable, a life ever abundant, and ultimately the presence of Jesus. Until that day, 
we can hold on to Psalms 116, one and two as a good starting point. I love the Lord for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. We know we can call on God and we know he'll hear us. He's faithful to respond. Maybe through his actions, maybe through his instructions to us, but he is faithful all the same. My encouragement to you today, above all else, is just trust him. No matter what trouble you face, just trust him. When I came back to my faith, when my wife dragged me to this church, I sat in a class uh, taught by Pastor Randy, and he said to a class that I was sitting in that we as Christians don't have to have all the answers. That was something I struggled with, was not having answers. And when he said, we don't have to have the answers, what I heard was, even shaky faith is still faith. We don't have to have the answers. Just trust him. Put that little bit of faith you have in him. Because shaky faith is still faith. And so I want to pray for y'all right now. And I want to pray for two kinds of people. If you've never trusted Jesus before, if you said, I'm not sure about this Jesus guy, I don't know if he can do anything, I want to challenge you to trust him. So if, you've, if that's you and you've never made the decision, and maybe you followed Jesus, but you've never made that decision to put this issue in his hands, I'm going to ask you to be bold. I'm going to ask you to stand up. I'm not going to ask you to come down to the front. I'm just asking you to stand. Maybe you've trusted him before, but this is a new thing, and I don't know if I can hand this over. If there's anybody who's like that, I just, I just would like you to stand so I can pray for you. It, you don't... It, you don't have to come down to the front. And then also, if you are a person who says, I've trusted, but I'm down to my last and I got nothing else left. This is it. It's over for me. I got nothing else to give. I got this mustard seed faith. If you are at that point, at the end of your rope with the situation or with a person or with how you're feeling about yourself, would you just stand up for a moment? I just want to pray for you. Again, I don't need you to come down to the front. I just want you to pray. I want to pray. There's a few people standing around here. And I'm going to challenge some other people. If you've put your faith in God and you have seen him move in your life before, when you trusted him, I want to ask you to go stand next to somebody who's standing right now. These people need to know, one, that they're not alone but two, that God has answered the prayers of other people. I want to tell you, God doesn't always answer prayers the way we want. Sometimes it's yes, sometimes it's no, sometimes it's not right now. But God is faithful. And I'm going to pray. Father God, I want to pray over these people. I want to thank you first and foremost for who you are because you are faithful. Your word does not come back to you void. Lord, you told us that if we just have mustard seed faith, if we just place it in you, then we could do unimaginable things. Lord, we don't, I'm not trying to move a mountain right now, Lord. I'm just trying to lay at your feet and put this issue in front of you and say, Lord, you deal with it. Whatever it is that you want done in my life, I'm giving it to you. I'm letting you have this but I'm asking you to move. Do this for me. Lord, sometimes we don't have the answers, but you have them. And when I sat in that class all those years ago, not having answers, I was broken enough to just trust you, and you have been faithful. I sat in these seats 11 years ago, and you've brought me to this place through your faithfulness. And I'm asking you, Lord, to move in the lives of these people around me. Lord, manifest yourself to them in ways that they can understand. It may be a song on the radio. It may be a touch of a person next to them. Lord, it may be something they saw on TV, or maybe it's your voice. I don't know. But I'm asking you to move and move in ways that they can understand. 
And my prayer is that as you move, that their faith grows, that they trust you in every situation. Before they make a decision, they say, let me put this before the Lord and let him make the decision. You are faithful. You have always been. You are now and you forever will be. And I thank you for that. I pray blessing over every person standing and even over those who may not have had the courage to stand. I thank you and I praise you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Come on, would you let Richard know how much you appreciate his heart? Three more tomorrow. We'll see you then. God bless you. Have a wonderful weekend.